Okay, so this is about a six point extension of the gathered fragment. And uh, it is inspired by the mucaculus. So the mucaculus uh, is a very, a very pleasant logic for uh, um, well, logicians. It's um, like an assembly language if you want to work with transition systems or with directed graphs. I mean, you can translate uh, all specification languages uh, into it. And unlike uh, some of the specification languages, it has um, reasonable model theoretic properties. So what the calculus does is start set out with a very simple logic, so basic model logic, that, uh, that means propositional logic plus the ability to quantify over successors of a current state. So it's a very, very restricted quantification pattern. And um, then add fixed point constructs which are useful if we want to, to write formula the way we would write programs. So what we can do is we have a notation for loops of this kind, like start with the empty set, and then apply an operator until nothing happens anymore, and then stop, return the value. And OK, the alternative is to start with the whole universe and apply the operator until nothing more happens. And so we have a very weak local logic that talks about, uh, about what happens to the current state and about the immediate successors. And then we have this simple recursion mechanism that lets us uh, move local assertions along passes, essentially. And that explains why uh, it, is, it, it, it can be interesting for verification, because in verification, we are very interested in, in executions. And uh, this is what the calculus can do well. I mean, it can run, run along executions and uh, describe how local properties evolve. And it has also the branching ability that the mu calculus has. So, the, uh, sorry, the model logic has. And um, there's something about this branching ability that to which we will come. So, first, if we look at uh, the mu calculus abstractly, is it, it is a, uh, a very friendly logic as it has a tree model property. So we have a, whenever a formula is satisfiable, we, we can find it satisfied in a tree. And also, it has finite model property. And then um, you can reprove uh, preservation theorems I mean, that show that things that, I mean, syntax and semantics are in a healthy relation and uh, interpolation and so on. And also, it is algorithmically friendly. So we are uh, quite close to P for the evaluation of the calculus formula. So actually, we are in a class in which the parity, uh, the um, primes were before NP and co NP. And uh, this gives us hopes to, that one day it will be shown to be in P. At the moment, it is not known yet. And satisfiability is next prime. OK, and then well, it, it is somehow maximal in what we could expect to have as a friendly logic. And uh, this maximality has to do with bisimulation invariance. So bisimulation uh, is, a, is logical equivalence for model logic. And uh, it means behavioral equivalence for, for systems. We, can, um, we will talk about different bisimulation relations later on. But I mean, as long as we don't want to distinguish bisimilar models, Model logic is as strong as first order. This was a very interesting uh, characterization by Van Bentham and Andre Kahnemetti. And, uh, and the calculus is the bisimulation fragment, I mean, the, um, of monadic second order logic. So it is like the lifting of model logic to a second order. And um, well, the key to, to most of the proofs that are relevant here, or have been relevant for the mucaculus, are that we have this bisimulation relation 
that allows us to manipulate models. So instead of working with arbitrary complicated models, we can also we can always massage things into trees. And then we can let automata run and then we get whatever we like usually. Automata very nicely behaved. And well, the ambition is to, to have a logic that is equally friendly but does not is not uh, restricted to to talk about executions. I mean not to about about transitions in, in graphs or and only forward moving uh, things, but um, well, it should be able to speak about databases, and it should be uh, so. It should be able to talk about hierarchies and not uh, have a notion of direction. And well, we can see how far we get. So, the idea for the model for for the gadget fragment is that to to take the model fragment and replace these guards which tell, look at successors with new, more general guards that say, okay, new, new, look at new variables that are linked to those who, in which we are free, I mean, to, to our currently uh, uh, free lab variables um, in, in a simple way. Okay. This is the, just the point that I think. So, we will look at uh, a very basic, well, the, I mean the basic guarded fragment, where these relativization guards are, uh, are atomic formula. So we have the relations from the vocabulary, and we have equality, and nothing else. And uh, then, to, to make some efforts, I mean, to explain why we do some efforts, we will talk about uh, a bit more, I mean, a more general fragment. And there, so the guards, so this formula that tell us how the newly quantified variables should re relate to the old ones, um, they talk about a generalization of being an atom. And being an atom, I mean, if we forget about arities, and so if we just, lo just look at the underlying structure of a, of a relational structure. So, I mean, the Geffman graph of a relational structure what does it do to a tuple that is, uh, that is in a relation? It makes a click out of it. Yes. And here we say we can, because I mean, a relation relates every two elements uh, in its entry. Now, we, we allow quantification over any members of a click. And uh, one consequence is of this is that as long as we are in the basic guarded fragment, so every time we quantify over new variables, they have to, to be connected through a relation. So we can never talk about more variables than our signature, our vocabulary is large. I mean, if our maximal arity is three, we can never talk about four variables that are alive at the same time. Okay, we can use equality, but it doesn't really help. So um, this is a, I mean, we can get rid of this, of this um, restriction by looking at this Geifman uh, sense of guarding. And there we can have formula that are, I mean, that have sub-formula with arbitrarily many free variables. So that's, that's one of the reasons. Yeah. We don't want, I mean, complexity results that are good because the widths are bounded by definition. Uh, that's a great condition that we can get that uh, the, the the elements that satisfy alpha with respect to z from the click? Yes. I mean, we can write it. Yeah. We know how the relations are called. So we can say that every two members in this, uh, in this um, uh, tuple, they are related in some way. So we will, we will quantify over the remaining members and we'll say, OK, these are, I mean, they are part of a relation. So you see, for example, if we have ternary relations, so, well, I draw them. So say I, I relate to these three things, with an R and these three things, and these three things. Now, uh, I mean, a priori, these three, they would not be, or I mean, all the four, yeah. they, they are not guarded in the strict sense. But they are guarded in the, the Geifman sense. 
So I, I can write a, a little formula that expresses that um, that I, I'm talking about four elements which are in this configuration. Is it? Hey. Yeah. I mean, syntactically, it's this. It is a formula that guesses whatever is needed to complete the tuples. And semantically, it is in the moment I have a valuation and I try to relate the subformula, I have to make sure that uh, well, the, the variables are allocated to something that's forms a click. So now we go to a logic that is stronger than the calculus and weaker than uh, first order logic plus fixed point. So we extend this guarded fragment with, with uh, least fixed point construct. And then we have the dual greatest fixed point construct. So the least fixed point you have seen already today, no? and uh, Anush and uh, Jam. And the greatest fixed point, uh, I don't know. well, it's just uh, the dual uh, notion. And uh, well, I mean, what we are sure immediately that we can do is we can talk about the mu calculus by referring to backwards modalities. So instead of saying I have a successor with certain properties, I say, can say I have a predecessor. Or I can talk about uh, edges that form a loop or but then, on the other hand, I can also speak about database, I mean, about, uh, about higher, topless of higher arity. Okay. And, well, I will try to put together some tools so that uh, it, I mean, we have everything that we used to have for mu calculus kind of uh, logics to do satisfiability. And then show you that actually these tools are not enough, and then maybe you. I mean, then, then we have a better insight on, on uh, why the, this, this logic is a bit more than just a calculus. OK, that's my intention. So I mean, a priori, we want to look at uh, questions of, I mean, OK, we have a formula. We have a structure. We want to know whether the formula is true on the structure. And then uh, we have two structures. We want to know whether there exists any formula that can distinguish them. And then we have only a formula. We have no structure. And we want to know whether there exists a model, or even less. So we have a formula, and we want to know whether there exists a finite model. So let's see how we approach these things with, I mean, knowing less and less about the structure. So if we know all about the structure, then it's about uh, model checking. And here, oh, sorry. So this is the problem. Yes, we, we want to know, we, we just want to evaluate um, guarded fixed point formula. This is not, I mean, there is nothing very deep uh, to this point. Okay, so no, a priori, I would just take uh, relations from the initial vocabulary as cards. Okay, so, um, so there will be some games that come in over and over again, and uh, Jam already made fun of me in saying that I'm I will probably talk about games, so, but I will not. It's about automata. So the underlying um, tool for, for doing um, model checking and also, I mean, to, to build up the automata later on are, are parity games. And um, so if we forget about the logics, these are quite simple games. We have two players, and they form an infinite path. So they are parity games are described by a graph. Is there anybody who has not seen? I mean, um, do I need to explain parity games? OK. Yes? OK. So this is the description. We have a directed graph. And then some of the no nodes are marked as belonging to one of the players. And then we have a, a labeling with of, of nodes with numbers. And uh, for this labeling, it's important that it has finite range. Otherwise, I would not, uh, I mean, I would not expect that this graph is finite. So it can be an infinite graph, but uh, I want this priority labeling to talk only about finitely many numbers. And then you c we can, so um, to play on such a, on such a graph, what happens is that we start at a given position. So this is a constant of the description. And then the two players form a path. 
this goes like is that if the current, I mean, if we are at a node that is marked to belong to well, player Alois, then she chooses the successor. And uh, if it is uh, not her node, then it is Abelard who chooses the successor. And this way, we continue a path. Now, it can happen that um, a player gets stuck, and then he has lost. And the game is, I mean, the play is over. And well, these are the clear cases. But it can happen that we have, we have an infinite uh, uh, way through the path. And then we look at the priorities that, were on the, that we met. And um, since the range is finite, we have seen infinite many nodes, then there must be some priority. I mean, there must be several priorities that appear infinitely often. But we look at the lowest one. And that needs to be even. So it's a, this, this may be a bit strange. But the point is we want to. Um, I mean, apparently we want to talk about things that happen over and over and again. And then we want to, to talk about them in a, in a nested way. So we want to, to just n not just talk about things that happen over and over again, but uh, we want to have some degree of freedom there. OK. And um, in such kind of games, I mean, a strategy okay, for one of the players would be uh, a function that tells for a given prefix how to continue. And here we are talking mostly about memoryless strategies. These are strategies, I mean, they are functions that just tell you at one node which successor to choose. So with a memoryless strategy, you can also play. You may not be able to win. You can follow this. So uh, following a strategy means uh, well, whenever you are asked to move, then you look at your prefix or at your current node, and you apply your strategy to choose your successor. And the winning strategy is one that guarantees that you will win everything, uh, I mean, all the plays, if you follow it. And uh, so if we, if we think in terms of graph and of, I mean, so we said a game is, is just a graph, and a memoryless winning strategy would be for the positions that belong to allies a selection of nodes or, or of, of successors, or just a selection of one outgoing edge. Yeah. So Alois has a winning strategy in a graph if she can select from each of her position one edge and throw the others away. And then to win means that every cycle that is formed in the remaining gra graph has a, an even minimum. And now for, for the other player, it means that I mean he can choose one successor from every node that belongs to him. and then every cycle has a, an odd minimum. And a priori, it's not so obvious no? that uh, either you can choose, I mean, from half of the nodes, you can choose a successor so that all the cycles are odd. Or you can choose for the other half some successors so that all the cycles are, are even. It's quite subtle. And well, this is the, the theorem that helps a lot. Uh, for automata, that uh, in a parity game, it is indeed the case that you, I mean, you are in one of these two situations. Either Alois can choose one successor that makes all the cycles even, or Abelard can choose a successor so that all the cycles are odd. And um, well, then the algorithms of parity game are I mean, so easy to understand, uh, not easy to, I mean, to up to the point to which we know them. Uh, if you have only one player, it is uh, not very difficult to see that. Uh, I mean, it's in p time to tell who is. The, I mean, whether he wins or not. And it means if you have a graph to tell whether all the cycles are are, are even or not. No, that's not difficult. And um, so, if we go to the two-player version, then it's about guessing. I mean, if you guess the strategy, then you can tell whether it's a winning one. So this gives you an NP thing, NP algorithm, and uh, you can do it for the other player, then it's a coin P, so we are NP, coin P. And um, the deterministic algorithms, they usually have the number of priorities in the exponent. But so there is a very interesting algorithm. If I had a huge amount of time, I would tell you a bit about it. So um, there is a, an algorithm that is really easy to understand. It, it builds kind of a, a potential. Uh, for the for the positions of the game, yes. and um, so the idea is that uh, if you have um, so uh, the, this potential is an encoding of a winning strategy. So it's something atomic. It's it's it, it, you assign a, a value to every node, and um, it's so 
whenever you you go lower, I mean, you look at the neighbors and you you go to you find a neighbor that has a lower potential, and you can take it, and this will guarantee finally that you that you win something like this. And um, so, a quite simple algorithm shows that uh, if you start with potentials, I mean, a vector of potentials that is about half the priorities. So this this is why we have this d half. Then, uh, well, I mean, this is enough to put in the exponent, and in the for the remainder we are, um, well, I mean, we have the the number of nodes in the basis. So and that determines the complexity. Okay. Now, um, so model checking for for uh, for gather fixed point logics is is exactly parity games. So, um, so, um, so what we do is we take the first order evaluation game a la Hintika, and then we we do something about the fixed points. So, uh, for the first order part. There will be no secrets, and uh, the fixed point, they do exactly what the priorities are responsible. Okay, so what is this? I mean, morally, this game is a product between the formula and the structure. So the formula, you can think of the, of the syntax tree. Okay, it's not really a tree. It has some loops because we do, I mean, because of the fixed point variables, but think of the syntax tree, and then you have the structure. So the positions in the game are an, a pointer to place in the formula, pointer to a place in the structure. And uh, we start in the, with the entire formula, and we point to well, no particular place in the structure because the entire formula doesn't have, uh, I mean, we, we talk about sentences with no free variables. And then the moves, they are designed in such a way that if a formula is true, with uh, the free variables bound to the pointers to the structure, then Alois should be able to keep it true. And if it's false, then Abelard should be able to keep it false. So this uh, means that uh, disjunctions and uh, existential quantifiers are removed, uh, like as in the Hintika games, uh, fixed point variables are just regenerated and we end in the atom. So this is the <coughs> what happens in detail. Um, so. Okay, yeah, this is not surprising. Yeah, we want to, so say we talk about Alois, she wants to prove that the disjunction is true and has a certain valuation. But, well, then she will choose one of the two members of the disjunction and will, ha will need to stay with the same uh, valuation. So this is what happens in a disjunction step, and conjunction is dual. Then for the quantifiers, we say Alois should prove that there is a witness Y that is uh, tightened with regard alpha to the open variables and then makes phi true. And we have, so the current valuation is, is beta. Uh, so what we will do, I mean, what possible successors are, the formula will certainly be phi that we need to prove, but then the valuations. So there, we will choose valuations that satisfy the guard, and this means guard in whatever sense. And they do, I mean, it's, uh, the new valuation should agree with the current one on the variables that uh, that I mean, on the, on the, and that are kept. You know, so we have new variables that are bound now, and then the x variables they they are kept. So they should not uh, be changed by this transition. Yeah. So it should be quite natural thing. But what is important is that, well, whenever we choose uh, something new from the structure, we move from a guarded tuple.